Hi, welcome to Shannon Q. I am Shannon Q, and I am excited to be here with you by myself this evening. This is the first time in a long time that I've done a stream on my own, and the reason that I am doing a stream on my own is because apparently I hate myself, and I consistently expose myself to Stand to Reason's content. And instead of following Paul around the house, Paul, Paul from Paul Logia around the house, complaining to him about how annoying I find them and all of the problems I have with some of their content, I thought that, you know, maybe I would, I would do it on the Intron web. This is essentially the YouTube of YouTube version of old man yells at cloud. This is old old lady yells at YouTube instead. So I'm I'm hoping that you guys will find some value in it. It's not something that I regularly do, but I am hoping that it is something that I will do uh, more of. As a content creator, I find that it's difficult for me. I often think that. Um, if I don't put like six months of research into a video that it's not worth posting. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I don't share my opinions generally. I mostly share, you know, the, the abject facts of the matter relating to, to, you know, some specific aspect of a claim. But sometimes I feel like maybe this is something that merits being done also. So you'll get, you guys will have to let me know in the comment section down below if this is something that you want to see more of. Um, and if the feedback is good, and this is the type of thing that you guys want to see, then I will do more of the content. Fair warning, I'm probably going to get a bit annoyed. I find um, Stand to Reason to be just, um, how can I say this kindly? Awful. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I really um, take umbrage with a lot of their content. And one of the reasons that I expose myself to Stand to Reason so consistently is that Stand to Reason um, is Greg Kokel's baby. And his book Tactics is something that I dislike because I dislike the idea of teaching people how to manipulate and in introduce um, rhetorical manipulation constructs into conversations in order to have people see things their way, um, as opposed to having honest dialogue. That's something that I, I have a preference for and advocate for, and that's the type of thing that their channel does. So anyway, I came across this video that we're going to be seeing. It is not Greg Kokel. It is actually John, and I don't know if I'm going to pronounce his name correctly, John Noyes, who is one of the people who um, works on Standard Reason. There's several other people aside from Greg Kokel who do content on the Standard Reason channel, and the link is in the description for the full video. Um, and I've done responses to them before. I did a response to um, Alan Schleeman, who is another one of the Standard Reason bros, um, who was discussing um, the history of homosexuality in the DSM, and there was a significant amount of correction. So if you if you like this content and have the same sort of attitude towards Stand to Reason that I do, you may enjoy that video where I laid out the actual history of homosexuality in the DSM and why it was removed, etc. Um, all that is to say, I came across this video and just immediately started kind of blabbing to Paul about all of the problems that I had with it. And rightfully so, he had the suggestion that maybe there might be some value in me doing that here. But I'm, I'm used to having conversations and not being by myself. So I, if I'm a little bit awkward, that's my general disposition. So we're all just going to have to deal with it. So <laughs> without further ado, and I will take questions as I go also. I'm going to pause this video probably a lot of times and have like a lot to say about the video. Uh, so you can either super chat me a question if you want to support the channel, that would be cool. And if not, no worries, just make sure that you tag me because I'm not great at following the chat in real time. So without further ado, we're going to find out why Christians are persecuted and why they need to get countercultural because everybody everybody knows they've got it the worst. That's just That's just that abject truth of the, that's just a fact of the matter. And I'm definitely not drinking wine. This is grape juice. I'm drinking a bottle of grape juice in order to get through this. All right, let's go. You ready to party? Let's do it. Hi, John. 
something uh something has to change <laughs> like has it's, to. it's time to make a shift a blending into the world around us is is no longer an option for the church and the culture rejects a christian worldview and won't be appeased by anything short of total ideological surrender i'm gonna pause so much so he talks for like a significant amount of time um the vi i'm not covering the entire video it's just his preamble for the first 10 minutes that i'm going to be covering but this was the first part that set me off because total ideological surrender is not something that the culture wants from christians there is literally not a soul on earth there is nobody saying, well, maybe there's somebody, sorry, but like the, the impetus of the culture is not that Christians can't be Christians. They can't believe what they want to believe. They can't, you know, enact their faith in whatever way they feel comfortable with without it being imposed on others. That is not the case. That is not what these people mean when they say that. And he will get further into it, but this absolutely set me off and I'm not afraid to admit it. Because they're creating themselves a victim complex. They're saying, essentially, culture isn't the way that we want it to be. And that is a direct attack on us. That is a direct attack on us. Them saying that people can be a way that we don't agree with, like, it, like whatever that may mean. And he'll get more into it later. And I'm sure you can guess. I'm sure you can guess. People not being the way that we are living their lives the way that we deem is appropriate um, is now becoming more accepted. And because it is becoming more accepted, that is a direct attack on us. And the only thing the culture wants is our total ideological surrender. So when you extrapolate that, what does that mean? It doesn't mean ideal ideological surrender because nobody's saying you can't be Christian, you can't believe in God, you can't do whatever you think Christians should do. What people are saying is you can't impose yourself on others. You no longer... But, and knock on wood, this isn't entirely the case yet, but you no longer have the reins of society. And now people don't have to live according to your religiously ascribed values and can live a different way. So what are they surrendering ideologically here? The answer is nothing. They're surrendering nothing ideologically. But what, they're, what they are surrendering from their perspective is the ability to force people to enact the type of behavior and conform a society or construct a society that enacts their values. And that is not persecution. That's the prevention of, of people overtaking a society that's egalitarian. And we're, we are one minute in. He's, he's about to get serious, though. He's got some very valid points to make, and we're all going to listen just very attentively and give him the benefit of the doubt, like I did. Like I did. So it's time for us to get countercultural, and that's what we're going to be talking about. Welcome to To The Point, my bi-weekly bi 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 live <laughs> video. Here we take a look at cultural issues from a distinctly Christian worldview. Um, I want to remind you that if uh, if you're watching this, you can add some comments. We're not going to read his comments. comments. Don't worry. <laughs> We're not going to listen to him answer questions. Ten minutes or so. Blah blah blah. Uh, I'd love to scroll through and and answer whatever questions that you might. I would have. love to scroll through as well. And, you can um, leave comments for yeah, me. Yeah. So there's something that's been on my mind recently that I'd like to to talk about, and that is uh, starting to think about living counterculturally. What are we going to do when the culture mean? really presses back at us? And I say us, I mean the church, I mean the, the Christians. And um, when I think about living countercultural, uh, Jesus, of course, comes to my mind. Of course it is. When the Pharisees you? asked if, uh, for example, paying taxes to Rome was, was lawful, Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. I think we all know that passage uh, pretty well according to jesus uh, some things actually do belong to caesar though not everything caesar thinks is his so i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna pause again i waited longer than i thought i would <laughs> that's not gonna last long though so don't get too comfortable in listening to john for long streams of consciousness so what i think he's trying to say here and this is just my interpretation which i think is a fair thing to do in situations like this, because you're putting it out there in the hopes that people are going to interpret it a certain way and receive it a certain way. 
And he's not being abundantly clear. Like, he's not just explicitly stating. He's hoping that people are going to make inferences. So if somebody makes an inference that he dislikes, then he can say, well, that wasn't my intention, but blah, blah, blah. All of that is to say that when he's talking about rendering things onto Caesar that are Caesar's and things onto God that are God's, he's using um, a passage from the Bible in order to reinforce the idea that even though God, you know, through his divine word said in the Bible that we do need to kind of, you know, live within the confines of society and respect governments, there's limits to that. There are limits to that. And the limits to that are open for my interpretation. And I'm going to tell you what those limits are. And those limits in in this instance are the denial of the ability to impose how society should be structured on that society, which actually I don't know that Jesus would agree with based on my reading of the Bible, but, you know, whatever. But I think that that is the groundwork that he is laying. And I'm very excited for it to get to the later part because that's the part that pissed me off the most, which I think the part that you guys will be most excited to see me lose my mind about is... So, so render to Caesar what's properly his, but more importantly, render to God the things that are God's. You know, and th- that begs the question, what belongs to God? Yeah, exactly. Well, we do. Rendering to God means uh, continuing to be faithful in all areas of life. Even when we live in a distinctly anti-Christian culture, how do we do that, though? Well, here's some pointers that I, there are some suggestions, I guess, that I have. You know, for- he's, got, he's got thoughts. He's got some thoughts. <laughs> he has some thoughts and some suggestions about. And d- did you catch what he said about um, what belongs to God? We do, right? And what he's using we as not just Christians. That we means humans, like humanity. And since we belong to God, this is, I think, the point that he's making. We should we should encourage and construct a society in a way that either encourages people to comport to that or makes it difficult or impossible uh, for people to exist in a happy and content fashion if they don't comport to that. We should be allowed to work to impose that without reprise, without repercussion, without any pushback. And they see themselves now as countercultural because the culture is progressing. Not enough, mind you, not enough, but the counter is the culture is progressing so that there is more representation of perspectives that are not from his view. And I know that there's Christians that disagree with him, and thank goodness for that. But from his view, like this on biblical, on Christian sort of lifestyle where the, there's religious pluralism and and there's more equality and people are, you know, represented fairly. And him, by him saying, we belong to God, that's him, that's him coding that because we belong to God, we don't belong to the government. So things that pertain to how people act and behave are things that we as Christians have an an absolute God-given right to have input on and influence over. That is how I read that. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that that is the message that he's attempting to deliver. Oh, you guys are already sending super chats. Cool. Thanks. I will read them. And then I will go back into it. Vibrantly Brantley. Thank you. Hi, hi. I haven't seen you in a while. Uh, don't have time to watch Take My Money. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Mr. Monster, I really want to call into atheist experience and talk heathen just to talk to those people. But I'm atheist. What would be a good topic for me to bring? And also, I love Apology. He does great information. Uh, he does great animation. He does do great animation. Um, I'm hesitant to suggest a topic. I only think that you should call if you have something that you think merits having a discussion. I don't think having a constructed uh, discussion because you want to speak to us as opposed to you have something you think would be interesting to talk to us about um, is necessarily as valuable. So if you would like to call us because you would like to get our perspective on something, um, that would be up to you. So do that. We would love to talk to you. 
Um, but I'm not going to suggest the topic because that would make it a very contrived conversation. So I hope that was a fair answer for you. And thank you for the super chat. I very much appreciate it. All right. Back to John. Who loves a good John noise? Not it. All right, let's go. First, God's people don't seek the world's approval. Instead of seeking the, instead we seek the approval of just one. When we try to curry the favor of the world, we're rendering to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar. He means God. No, I'm rather, we, we render to uh, Caesar the thing that belongs to God, mainly uh, his favor. We worry about what God thinks about us, not what Caesar thinks. Uh, James, he, he's clear about this. He reminds us, he says that, 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 do you not know that a friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be friends with the world makes himself an enemy of God. So this, like... There's, it seems to be locked and loaded persecution narratives. It's just so intrinsically built into the foundations. And you see any pushback, any pushback at all, that you know you may have a perspective that's not acceptable within society, regardless of the justifications that are provided. Instead, though... <laughs> That, that's just to be expected because that's worldly and Christians should expect that they're not to be, you know, in lockstep with the world because they belong to God. So, so, so they don't have to, they have a different mission. They have a different mission. And when society tells them that things can be a different way, that's just affirmation. That's that's not something that they have to like look at and critically analyze. That's just affirmation of this prediction that the world is going to be against them and proof that they need to fight harder to make the world what God wants it to be. And that it's such a it's such a dangerous perspective because it's so imbued with this pride, this pride that in this sort of credulity, this indignation, this righteous indignation that, that they have the right way. And because they have the right way, they should be able to dictate that to others, regardless of the pushback, because any pushback is just to be expected. That's the type of persecution that is predicted. And him tying it into like the Caesar thing is just talking about, you know, the government and society in general. The government and society in general are, are going to be worldly. They're going to be outside of what God wants. And it is their job to make society and the world and the government what God wants. That is what they are tasked with. It's such a dangerous, like, such a dangerous perspective because it's almost impermeable to reason because it's labeled truth just intrinsically without any need for further support. And they could do so much damage to so many people and have having this perspective. All right. You know, um, I guess what I'm getting at here is, is that, that Caesar, he's going to offer friendship, but his offer of friendship, it, it's false. Why? He, he turns on us the moment we present God's truth. There's no neutrality here is what I'm saying. No middle ground, no meeting the culture where it's at, hoping to gain acceptance. So the first point is, is, uh, is don't give Caesar what rightly belongs to God. Secondly, God's people don't compromise on what the Bible says about controversial issues, uh, issues like um, human sexuality. There it is. Who had it? I, I should have put up a poll. <laughs> I wish you could put up a poll where people could put their own answers in. <laughs> who, who would have been able to guess? <laughs> who would have been able to guess that all of this, all of this was about homosexuality? Like if, who would have been able to, it, it's, it's, such a surprise, right? Who could have seen that coming? Who could have seen that coming? That 
the reason that they're persecuted, the reason that society is against them, the reason that they need to be a counterculture is because now the culture allows people, not again, not enough, but allows people who are, you know, trans, who are homosexual, who are just basically not cishet, accepts and allows them to a higher degree than in the past to just exist and be happy. And that's not acceptable if you're God's people. Like if other Christians, if you're listening to this, I just really, really hope this isn't you. Because one of the reasons I think that he brings up um, compromise a lot here is because some, like I just recently spoke to um, to a, a pastor, to Colby, um, who's very progressive and pro-LGBT. And like there's a lot of progressive movements within Christianity that are moving in that direction as well, into the direction of more acceptance. And I would love to to be able to encourage that and, you know, not exclude people who accept that and and are like that and can see that in the scripture. I think that that is ideal. But he's working against you. He's actively saying that you are basically not a real Christian. You are you're not one of the good ones. He's got it right. You've got it wrong. You are doing damage. God is mad at you. Because you think that it's okay for people to, you know, just exist and be gay. And we can't let that happen. Because if we let that happen, if the culture allows that to happen, then that's an affront to Christianity. That is us being persecuted. And the more the culture accepts that, the more we need to be countercultural. We need to create a movement to counter the culture of acceptance and make that culture more unaccepting so that it's more Christian. That's what he's saying. That's the wagon <laughs> that you're hitching yourself to. And he's using a delightful language in order to not explicitly state it, but that's the implication. Bah! Whatever. Oh, somebody said that he's not loud enough. I'll make him louder. Against my better judgment. All right, let's listen to hopefully louder John. Identity, abortion. You know, the world doesn't want us to speak our message clearly, so it condemns the words we use because of the ideas behind them. When we use words like, for example, sin, rebellion, salvation, and repentance, we're labeled uh, hateful bigots or intolerance or, or worse. We, we might even be accused of committing hate crimes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Nobody, nobody nowhere ever has said that <laughs> ever has said that using the word sin is a hate crime just using the word sin he has stripped this of any type of context in order to make it seem like people aren't justified in saying he's being bigoted against LGBTQIA plus people as if him just saying the word sin or bringing up sins is, is somehow just, you know, him telling the truth and then just doing that, just people are just going to accuse you of a hate crime just, just for saying sin exists, which is just ridiculous on its face. It's just ridiculous on its face. He's removing any context. If you're accused of a hate crime, it's likely because you did something overtly bigoted that had that directly damaged a person or group of people. That is a hate crime. But he's attempting to obfuscate it, to make it seem as though the things that they do aren't that bad, really. They're just telling the truth about sin. And 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 the poor them. Poor them. Poor, poor them. They're be, they're they're being told that they're that they're bigots that are committing hate crimes, just be just because they said sin exists. That's not the case. 
You're being called, if you're being called a bigot and being accused of a hate crime, it's because you're attempting to do something or influence the culture towards something or addressing a group of people in a way that attempts to subjugate them and prevent them from living a happy, healthy, and full life because you wish to impose your perspective on how they should live their life on them against their will. It's, it's not a difficult concept. It's really not. Don't be a bit, leave everyone else alone. There is no one attempting to prevent you from being a Christian. Not a soul. You can believe whatever. I will not stand in front of you while you're attempting to walk into a, tur- a church, John. I just won't. I never will. Most people won't. 99.99999% of people in the world, regardless of their belief, will not attempt to impede you from practicing your beliefs. What we will attempt to do 100% of the time is prevent your beliefs from impeding others. It's, it's just that simple. It's none of your business. State of people's lives. They are not hurting you. Grant them the same respect that you're demanding while saying that you're persecuted. While saying that you need to be countercultural. You're, you need to be countercultural. Why? Because somebody is preventing you from being Christian? No, nobody is. Because somebody is telling you you can't believe what you want to believe? Nope, nobody is. You're being, you, you need to be countercultural because what? Oh, because you need to, you need to and want to create and cultivate a society where people can't do that for themselves. You want to prevent other people from doing the very thing that you're complaining about. Like, uh, how is that not obvious? How? And uh, like, in what world is that not fucking obvious? Like, Practice what you preach. Practice what you preach. You want people to not impede your ability to believe? You want people to not stand in the way of you living your life in the way you see fit so long as you are not, and this one's key, harming or attempting to impose it on others? Then don't just do the same. Just do the same. It's not that difficult. It's not that difficult. You are not the victim here. You're attempting to victimize people. And people are saying, hey, maybe don't do that. And you're like, whoa, you just called me a bigot. And now my feelings are hurt. Still re- re- uh, remain resolute. Remember. In what? Um, we don't have a license to be unloving, though. Maybe I shouldn't We, do we can't be nasty and, or mean jerks for Jesus. But we also can't give in to the cultural pressure to... We, d- we can't be nasty or mean. Like, we, we just need to make sure that we control our tone so that we seem like the nice ones while we're telling you that you need to go to conversion therapy and not live a happy life and make yourself miserable and put you through torture. We need to make sure that we're, we're presenting that as love, which is even more nefarious also fucking by the way. That's more nefarious because if you present harm as love... That's abuse. That's abuse. That's trapping someone in a cycle of abuse because they think that being hurt is love. They think that avoiding repercussions is love. And I can't imagine wanting that for somebody that I loved. Maybe, maybe we have different definitions of love, but I would opt for mine. Where so long as the person that I love isn't causing harm or impediment to anybody, I allow and encourage them to be themselves and help them find that actualization and support them through that process so that they know they're supported no matter what, as opposed to making them feel like my love is conditional. But I mean, what do I know? I'm the bad one, not you. You're just trying to make things more godly. You compromise our message. Instead, we have to stay salty. And, and lastly, God's people remain level-headed in all circumstances. And this is really important. We don't allow ourselves to get all worked up just because the world is, is, is doing what the world does. The world's going to be illogical, irrational, and, and, and sometimes incapable of civil discourse. 
we expect that of people in darkness because they can't see clearly. They, they, they bump into things. So now he's talking about like, this is one of the reasons I watched Santa Reason quite a bit, actually, is because I studied communication. The, one, one of the things that I studied when I did my degree in psychology was it was per perceptual cognition and communication theory. Those are my loves. And what he is doing now is he is setting the groundwork out. He is saying that if somebody is, you know, we need to remain calm so that we can control the perception of us, right? Because if, if we're the ones who are calm, and we can even juxtapose this against me right now, right? So I was just not calm. I may have been right, and I think that I probably was, but I used explicatives. I, like I said a swear. I did, I did a swear. Um, I didn't fully control the undulation of my voice. It was raised. And I spoke in a rapid pace. And I indicated a degree of possible aggression. So because I did those things, amongst other things, while I was communicating... Regardless of the content of what I was communicating, he's now able to essentially kind of poison the well by saying, well, did you ha she's one of the people in darkness. We need to be the ones who are calm. We need to control how we deliver messages. And if we are controlling how we deliver messages, then that juxtaposition between us being, you know, the calm, rational ones while we're saying, you know, you don't really deserve these rights and you're not, you know, a good person and God's going to punish you and all of these bad things and you need to not be yourself and we want to change everything about who you are and we don't think that you have a place in society. You know, if we do that in the appropriate tone, then we'll seem like the rational ones because of the tone that we're using. And because what he is saying is so inflammatory there's a natural response like the one that i just had that people are going to meet that with hey like what the fuck no like that's not okay you can't do that to people that's unacceptable and they comparatively will seem like the the irrational ones because in that situation one person has a told a tone that's controlled and the other person has a tone that seems more emotional and emotional tones are tied mentally um to perceptions of have being less rational whether that is the case or not that's just kind of part of the way that we're wired so one of the reasons i watch santa reason quite a bit is because they have this awareness of communication dynamics and perceptions around communication and they utilize it as a tool they even wrote a book about it in order to use rhetorical strategies as to manipulate people. Um, and, and some of those can be effective. So I wanted to call that out. One, because I'm, I know that there's going to be times that I'm not able to control my tone, especially since I'm live. I would probably be more capable of controlling my tone if I wasn't live because I would have time, you know, for reflection and scripting, which is one of the reasons I kind of prefer that. Um, as opposed to like an immediate visceral sort of off the cuff reaction. But that is worth calling out. And it's worth noting, not just in this video where I'm talking. Is being the world. We should expect it. Uh, and, and keep in mind that the, the world, the, the be world knows us. nothing about peace. Uh, certainly the peace that comes with knowing God, that peace that surpasses all understanding. They don't know about trusting a sovereign Lord. When the world acts like the world, remember, we're not dealing with light. We're dealing with darkness. And, and, and when darkness is dark, we have to stay. The dark darkness is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. When the darkness is dark, that, that, I can't. I can't. I only I my preference is the light darkness. The light darkness is the best kind of <laughs> darkness. The dark darkness is intolerable. I can't stand the dark darkness. Focused on our task. It's our job. It's your job, Christian, to be the light. Whether it's, it's foregoing worldly approval, standing firm in our convictions, or remaining 
calm in all circumstances. Be prepared to render to God that which is God's. And, and then when the test truly comes, when the powers of darkness press in on you from the structures of this world, we'll continue to do God's work God's way. So notice that the juxtaposition that he's using where Christians are the light and everybody other than Christians are the darkness. And when, when the darkness comes in being like anything, that's not what they espouse to be in Christianity, they need to be the light, which is called action. They need to go out and do something about it. They need to speak up. They need to be the ones who are attempting to make the world godly and that juxtaposition that he's using is uh, is purposeful because they're in the right and everybody else is in the wrong, regardless of what they say. And notice, again, he's talking about tone and cadence when it comes to addressing these topics and, you know, remaining calm. And just before my, my other stream decided to implode upon itself, um, <coughs> pardon me, um, I was going over how these tactics, these rhetorical tactics, are important to call out. They're important to call out because controlling cadence and controlling the manner in which you speak on a topic is a way of making yourself seem like the calm, rational one when the other people the people who you're attempting to subjugate in many cases, and in, in this case, um, them be having an emotional reaction to you is, is then perceived as irrational as a result of the juxtaposition. So that's a, that's a purposeful tactic that, that's being used. Friends, let's be reminded too here that, that underneath the surface of the visible world, a uh, battle rages in an unseen realm. Dark, wicked, supernatural forces seek to rule the world by force. And the carnage, the, 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 there's casualties. Then they're all around us. No, this isn't a physical battle. It's spiritual. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, Paul says, but against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Again, the juxtaposition. So Christians are absolutely in the right. They are good. They are the light. Anybody who is not a Christian is darkness. And now added layer, added layer, there's spiritual forces. So there's, you know, bad forces. And he's going to get into discussing the devil here shortly. Um, that um, are causing this to happen. There's abject evil. Abject evil is the reason that this is happening. It's not a matter of arguments. It's not that the person that you are attempting to subjugate or the people that don't believe like you are just, you know, seeing things differently. They're being coerced. They're being coerced by the devil. There's, there's demonic and dark forces forces at play here so it's super there's a supernatural component to this and i often wonder how that works right so do the supernatural forces just stop at the door of christians and say oh we can't get these guys can't get these guys we can only get you know atheists and and people who believe in different religions and you know agnostics those are the only people that we can somehow influence Christians, we, we can't influence. Uh, it, it's just the strangest thing to me to appeal to this sort of supernatural component that's bringing people into darkness and having this impact on the world that's somehow simultaneously imperceptible and also apparently obvious. That's and that's what you have to fight against. It's a way of making people who disagree with you not just not it's a way of making them not just be in opposition to your ideas, but actually be evil, actually be evil. It's a way of controlling the perception to other them so much that they're that they're perceived entirely as evil. In this battle, Satan's weapons aren't bombs and bullets. They, they, they aren't raw power or demon possession either. His chief weapons are lies and deceptions. We've talked about this before um, on, on to the... 
Who is he lying to and deceiving in this case? I wondered about that too. Like he's saying that it's the devil. So the devil is doing this. The devil is making society the way it is. And the devil is doing this by lying. Who is the devil lying to? Is the devil able to control my mouth, for example? Right now, is the devil somehow delivering a message through my mouth, unbeknownst to me? So the devil has the ability to control people? And, and at what scale also? So control how, how many people and how many people simultaneously? It just doesn't seem feasible in any sort of realistic sense to say, well, there's a supernatural monster that's making the world like this and we have to fight against it makes you seem like you're righteous when in fact, the, 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 in and of itself, it's, it's utterly foolish as just as a concept, but it's a great way if you buy into it to just fully other those people um, without making it seem like you actually are. So you're making it seem like those people are evil, but then you have, the, you have the eject button that you can say, well, I'm not saying you're evil. You're, you know, it's society itself, which you're a part of, is under the influence of the devil, but you can't point to where the devil is exerting that influence. Uh, it's, just a, it's just an assertion that it's entirely unfounded and impractical. The point, as I address the, 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 the culture, culture of cancellation or cancel culture. Yeah, sure. Satan can harm us physically. He can. And, and, can and, he? and we see this all in the scripture. And sometimes he does. But, but most of the spiritual warfare that we encounter, though, it's not, wep- it's not power encounters against his, Satan's physical attacks. Instead, it's, it's, uh, it's truth encounters against his spiritual lies. Who is he lying to and how? So, so Explain yourself. In response, we... We don't respond with, with uh, spiritual chest pounding, but instead we, we, we respond with a, with a gracious and sound and, and measured proclamation yeah. of the truth. Again, he's talking about controlling. See, uh, how you have you to you remember who Satan approach. is. You know, Jesus, he calls Satan a liar and the father of lies. He says there's no truth in him. He warns us uh, that our battle is against a, a deadly foe who lies, cheats, and steals. So I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, again, I'm not clear who he's fighting against here. He's fighting against the culture. And the problem with the culture is that they're now accepting more so of people who are trans and people who are gay and people who aren't Christian and is becoming more pluralistic in that fashion. Um, but that taking place is the result of the devil, uh, but there's no explanation as to through what mechanism that's taken place, which leads me to believe that the devil must somehow simultaneously be influencing or controlling somehow everyone who isn't a Christian which seems trivially foolish because if the devil has that kind of power, why isn't he also controlling Christians? Like what magic protection spell do you have as a Christian? Like I'm a, I'm a deconverted Christian, for example. Did I, ha- did I have the magic spell of protection up until I stopped believing? Was the devil able to make me stop believing? And if that's the case, why isn't he able to make you stop believing? Or did I stop believing organically uh, because I couldn't rationalize it anymore? And then now I'm, I'm, I'm subject to the influence of the devil because I lost my magic protection spell. Like none of this makes sense to me, but it's a fascinating sort of scare tactic. Um, that that Christians use consistently while they're simultaneously othering people because it's a way of, like I said, labeling people as the most evil thing that a Christian can think of while simultaneously having the out of saying, well, I'm not saying it's you. I'm actually saying, you know, you're just part of a culture that's been cultivated by the devil. But then I don't actually have to explain how it's been cultivated by the devil. Um, I can just assert it 
And that's terrifying enough to Christians that they'll see you as evil, but I have the out of not saying you're evil myself, just, you know, implying it by affiliating you and people like you with the devil. You see, the devil's deceptions, Paul calls them schemes in Ephesians 6, 11. More devil. Uh, and they're sophisticated strategies he uses to, to gain a foothold to exert his influence over people. How? Satan, he, he preys on those not ready for combat and and his <laughs> plans it, it's working we just have to look all around currently the cultures oh so that's interesting so he's saying the devil pr preys on people who aren't ready for combat so maybe that's a susceptibility metric if you're if if you're a christian who's ready for combat who's willing to take up arms and like join him in his fight then you aren't susceptible to the devil influencing you anymore um, so the only way to, you can't be a passive Christian, you can't just be a Christian who believes and minds their own goddamn business. You need to be, <laughs> you need to be a Christian who's willing to take up arms with him in order to reduce your susceptibility to the devil. And that also means that he can vilify and affiliate other Christians, other practicing Christians who affirm that they're Christians. He can affiliate them with the devil too. Because he can now say, well, they weren't willing to take up arms. The devil is influencing them. The only people the devil isn't influencing are people who are, you know, arm in arm with me in the battle. Interesting tactical choice. In the crushing grip of, of, of three of Satan's cons, uh, moral relativism, religious pluralism, and, and sexual progressivism. Okay, so <laughs> we already knew he thought sexual progressivism. <laughs> sexual progressivism. We already knew he thought that that was, you know, Satan's work and bad. Like, he's, a, he's established that pretty thoroughly. And moral relativism, we know most Christians, like, even, even Christians who aren't like him, are going to, like, espouse to that. But the interesting thing to me was that he said religious pluralism. And this set my brain, like, going in circles because I couldn't figure out <laughs> for the life of me how that could be the case. So he's saying that the devil um, is the reason for religious pluralism, which means, you know, the fact that more than a religion exists that people believe in. However, Jesus was Jewish. <laughs> Jesus, was, Jesus was a Jew. So that religion not only existed before Christianity, but the Lord and Savior of Christianity believed it. But it is a very separate religion from Christianity. So it how what did the devil do? Did the, <laughs> did, did the devil make Christianity then? Did the devil make Christianity? Like, because that's the only way that it makes sense because the Abrahamic monotheistic religion prior to Christianity was Judaism. So Judaism predates Christianity. So Christianity coming into existence, like even if you ignore all other religions that predated and coexisted with it, created a pluralistic version of Abrahamic monotheism. So if he's saying that the devil is the reason for religious pluralism, then it would st it would stand to reason <laughs> that Christianity is the work of the devil if you follow his logic. It doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make any sense. I, I understand what he's getting at. He's getting he's trying to say that any religion that isn't Christianity is the work of the devil. They're bad, they're evil, and you're trying and, and the devil is deceiving people. But I don't think he thought it through. <laughs> I really don't think he thought it through. <coughs> because Jesus was a Jew. <coughs> Sorry, I choked myself because it just seems I don't know, maybe I'm alone in that. But that that follows in my mind. I don't know, at me and or comment in the in the comment box down below but that seems to me to be what he's saying the devil's responsible for religious pluralism ignoring all other religions that predate christianity judaism predates christianity the invention of christianity created a pluralistic version of abrahamic monotheism if the devil's responsible for pluralism then 
Then what? <laughs> I don't think he thought that through. Anywho, whatever. That one just struck me as funny. We are we already know the moral. I'm not going to get into the moral side of things today. That's I, I I don't have enough time to get into talking about that. That's a whole nother ball of wax. And he will talk more about all of our all of our sexual misconduct very shortly. So don't worry, he's getting through it. You know, the, and, and we see the results. The results of his schemes are everywhere. For example, um, many of the commercials during the Olympics this year featured gay, lesbian, transgender he's about to fly off the relationships. Rails. <gasps> of... Did, you hear that? <laughs> Did you hear that? Many of the commercials during the Olympics, they 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 told us the trans people exist and gay people, and that sometimes they have relationships, like. That's the devil. Happy people minding their own business in relationships. Wow. That's. Whoa. The world is evil. Satan creeping into the homes on prime time television. Amazon Prime, Netflix, and, and, and Disney all feature movies depicting similar themes. You know, and, and no one's out of reach. Tragically, it. even our children are targets. And in 2017, Disney introduced a, a lesbian couple in the cartoon feature Doc McStuffins. And last year I was watching. If you had given me a hundred years, <laughs> a million guesses about where this was going to go, I would not even have come close to predicting that the devil was influencing the production team at Doc McStuffins. <laughs> not true. That's no chance. There's, a, there's just no chance that I that I would have landed Doc McStuffins is where this is going. Zero percent <laughs> chance. And it's just like, so what? Like, I don't understand why. Well, I kind of do understand why. It just annoys me. Um, people like John here are so upset that people who are gay and trans are just depicted as existing as a component of material reality um, in the realm of entertainment, which is attempting to depict the realm of material reality. Why wouldn't they? Why would they not? Why would they not? Unless you were actively attempting to suppress that so that people weren't exposed to the fact that they exist as a component of material reality. That is, that is the only reason. That is the only reason that you would be shocked by that. Is that you think that that should be suppressed. It's it bonkers to me. Just absolutely bonkers to me. Watching The Babysitter's Club with my little kids, my daughters on Netflix. And, and they introduced a, a little boy character. Who believed he was a little girl? You mean a trans and girl? Most recently, you mean a trans uh, girl. Blues Clues. My kids had it on upstairs. They had a family pride parade hosted Good. by a drag Good. That sounds team. awesome. The celebration Great. highlighted families with lesbian matters. mothers, gay fathers, and, and parents who are who are non-binary, trans, ace flux, bisexual, and pansexual. The the creators even included a, a cartoon beaver with with chest scars so from a double mastectomy. All these programs, by the way, were rated TVG aimed directly at our children okay so i have i have a significant amount to say about this so i'm gonna i'm gonna go on the screen so i had a conversation earlier about this because what frustrates me is this perception that people who aren't cishet existing on screen anywhere isn't something that's acceptable for children because that is not something that heterosexual relationships are on screen or heterosexual representation on screen or, you know, cis representation on screen is like is subject to like at all. It's just it's not something that is the case when it comes to cishet representation. So what that tells me is... Let's use an example. This is an example I used earlier in a conversation about this while I was following Paul around the house, driving him insane about how, how bad this bothered me. 
So uh, let's use an example everybody is familiar with. So we're going to use Full House, right? So most people know what Full House is. So Bob Saget lived with two other men, right? So he lived with John Stamos and he lived with Dave Coulier. John Stamos was his brother-in-law, I think, and that Dave Coulier was his friend. So that whole series is over. It's already happened. Everybody agrees with 100% certainty. That's a, that's a family show. Everybody will say, I think unilaterally, I think even John would agree with me that it's a family show. Now, if everything else about that show was stayed constant, nothing changed, every episode was exactly as it was, and you found out later on down the line that Dave Coulier and Bob Saget were actually a couple in that show, would that suddenly not be a G-rated show anymore as a result of that and that alone? Because that's fun functionally what he's saying. He's saying, if you find out that a couple or any two people in a relationship are not cisgendered and heterosexual, then suddenly that show, regardless of the content of the show or the context of the representation, it should not be shown to children. So why then? The, the, that, now the question's why, right? So, because his answer in this instance would be, I think, yes, that should not be, a, a, or sorry, no, that shouldn't be a G-rated show anymore. Now it's not a show that children should see. So the only, everything else is constant. The only thing that has changed in this scenario is that the couple, like the, the two men are in a relationship whether it is or isn't re represented on screen or how it's represented, just the fact that that is the case that means that children shouldn't see it. What's the reason children shouldn't see it? The reason children shouldn't see it from their perspective, I think, I think, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is one of two reasons or possibly both. Reason number one is he just thinks it's wrong, period, full stop, for anybody to see anyone that's gay ever. That's just not a thing that should happen. Nobody should be exposed to that, specifically children. That's just not a thing that anybody should ever be exposed to. The second thing, and I think me be more so the case, and in my experience seems to be the case, um, is that when it comes to people who aren't cisgendered and heterosexual, the representation that is generally portrayed, or not the representation, what's a better word for this, the... The way that they are generally attempted to be portrayed by people who are talking about why they shouldn't be seen is that they are perverted or that they are dangerous or that they um, are going to have undue influence and just them existing and us be as an, in the cultural awareness is somehow dangerous by virtue of them existing. And if we see more represent, this is why representation is so important, like so, so, so desperately important, um, is because if we start to see normalized representations that just depict non cishet people, like people who are gay, people who are trans, people who are ace, just depict them as normal people living their lives who just so happen to have this as a component or aspect of themselves, then that narrative starts to fall apart. We start to go, oh, shit, like they're just normal people who are like us in many ways and not like us in these this way and maybe some others, but... None of them are dangerous. None of them are perverted. None of them are something that we need to be concerned about. And that's private and personal to them and really none of our business. Just like our private and personal relationships 
aren't anybody else's business either. And we're the same in that fashion. And that is what's dangerous to, to, to people like this, is the idea that people are going to go, oh, maybe we shouldn't be scared of these people. Maybe we shouldn't be villainizing these people. Maybe they are just like us. Because the more that happens, the more cultural acceptance happens, and the more difficult it becomes for them to subjugate them. And fucking good. And fucking good. Good. Good, John. Good. That's what we want. Just because Doc McStuffings... (laughs) Doc, like, just because a cartoon child doctor um, had a gay couple on their show doesn't mean that all of the kids are going to be the gay also. So, like, that, that's an unwarranted fear. What it does mean is that if a child who is watching it is gay, um, they go... Oh, maybe I don't have to be so afraid of myself. Maybe some of the messages I'm receiving about people like me aren't actually true. And maybe there is a way that I can be happy and exist in society um, as myself. Wow, that's cool. I'm like, why wouldn't you want that? Like, why wouldn't you want that? Why are you so dedicated to making sure that (laughs) people who aren't like you feel as though they don't have a place in a society where you exist. But, and you, and you call yourselves the moral ones. Just dumbfounding to me. It's utterly dumbfounding to know you're actively harming people and doing your best to make sure you perpetuate it while saying, we're the light and they're the darkness, while talking out of the other side of your mouth about who is and isn't evil, get a grip. You see, why do I bring these up? Well, the the normalization of of gay and lesbian parents and transgender children is is just one example of the kind of schemes Schemes! Paul talks about. Schemes! Well, let's go deeper. So the devil made them gay then, I guess, because the schemes were the devil, right? We're, we're, this is a callback because the devil does schemes and is a liar. So seeing gay people exist and seeing trans people exist and just letting that happen and being okay with it because they do exist and it is okay is a scheme. It's a scheme. It's a scheme. So who, the, the, but from the devil. So did the devil make them gay then? Did the devil make them trans? Did the devil make Doc McStuffins writing team? Like put the, put the characters in? Like where, where does the devil factor in here? Like it's just so many layers of foolishness that I don't understand. I, like I just, I don't understand how anybody, anybody listens to this and goes, yeah, that makes total sense. Yep. Yeah. Uh huh. That's evil. You're right. The devil is totally controlling the pen of the writing team at Doc McStuffins, so that, so that what? Like, do do you actually think that children seeing representation is going to make them go, maybe I'll be gay? I wasn't going to be gay before, but now that I know that the that there's a character on Doc McStuffins who's gay, then. Now, now I'm going to be like, it's freaking ridiculous. It's like, it's so foolish on its face. So foolish on its face. Well, how, how do we stand firm in our convictions and in a way that's pleasing to God? How do we resist the lies and deceptions of Satan? Well, Paul, don't be gay. Like <laughs> I emphasized this before in the stream that crashed and burned. It's like just nobody is telling you how to live your life as a Christian. If you want to not be gay and not have abortions, and be a Christian, there is absolutely no one trying to stop you. Like, none of us are standing in front of you going, you can't go into church, go marry that dude over there, and then I would like you to become a woman, and I don't want to hear another word about it. That is not a thing that's happening to anyone, you 
you're bonkers. I, I calmed myself down. <laughs> I had to control my words for a moment. I was about to use a word that wasn't kind, but I pulled myself back in. That is not what's happening. What is happening is there's a version of that that you're doing. You're saying that people who aren't like you, who don't believe like you, who don't have relationships like you, not, should be subjugated to the background and should absolutely not be visible and should change. And that anybody who tells you that that isn't the case is somehow, somehow persecuting you. I, how does, how, how do people... How? <laughs> it's so obvious on its face. They're like, if, if, if I can't tell people how to live their lives, that's persecution because it's my God-given right to tell people how to live their lives. So I get to decide what's represented. Like, don't let your kid watch Doc McStuffins anymore then. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Gay people exist. So do trans people. So do atheists. All of us exist. And none of us are stopping you from being Christian. The only thing that will stop you from doing is telling us how to live our lives. One of us is doing those things. One of us is trying to tell somebody how to live their lives. One of us isn't. Which one could it be? Oh, he actually tells us. Uh, we just read Ephesians 6. See, Paul, Paul tells us how to combat the lies of the enemy that hold the rest of the world captive. He says, therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist the evil day, in the evil day, rather. And having done everything, he says, stand firm. You see, this is Paul exhorting the Christian to stand firm in opposition to the enemy. The enemy. We're the enemy. Everybody's not them as the enemy. And they have to stand firm against us. They literally have to fight us. They literally have to tell us how to be. This is why I sometimes, like, he's done, by the way, so now you just have to deal with me. I sometimes go back and forth about making some of this content. I legitimately and seriously do. Because there's aspects of the atheist community even itself that I'm not a fan of, <laughs> right? Like, there's some misogyny in there, too. There's some transphobia in there, too. There's... There's, there's all kinds of things that I don't like there. So it kind of feels like, you know, clean up your own house <laughs> before you do anything else. And I... Uh, but this stuff, we're so busy focusing inwards policing sometimes, too, that We can lose track of the fact that we have like a common goal, which is that this type of rhetoric has a stranglehold on society. Like it, it, it absolutely does. Like this channel doesn't have many subscribers and the, they don't get a lot of views, but the podcast gets m m millions of views and the books millions of people read them and these are the ty and and they're not alone they're just a pebble on the beach there's so many of them <laughs> there's so many of them and there's so many more of them than us and they have such an ability to actually influence culture and this new dynamic that, I don't know if dynamic's the right word, but this new rhetoric that they're using that anybody who attempts to be open about living a life they don't agree with is somehow persecuting them when they say, hey, you can't tell us what to do when they're not harming anyone. Is that somehow like impinging upon their religious freedoms I, it has material repercussions. Like, look at what's happening in Texas right now. Like, trans children in Texas 
are literally at risk of being torn away from their families if they give them affirming care. If they do, if the parents are loving and caring and informed and supportive enough to do what needs to be done to make that child happy and healthy, the government can literally label that abuse and take them away because of shit like this. It has just such material affect. Uh, I just... <sighs> Maybe this is why Paul asked me to stream instead because I, like, it makes me want to cry. <laughs> it makes me want to cry. Uh, it sucks. Like, it just, it literally sucks. And I don't understand. Maybe I'm wired differently. Maybe, I don't understand how you could have a channel like this where you say with a straight face that we're the ones who need to be strong because we have so many people so many people who we vastly outnumber and have all of the power over that are maybe slightly gaining some ground and we need to make sure we push them back into the dark because we're the good ones and what we need to do is just, you know, do our best to make sure that they're invisible or miserable, or both. And then go to bed at night and like sleep soundly. Like I couldn't deal, like, I just couldn't deal with it. I couldn't, I could not deal with it. Uh, I couldn't. I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for coming for this experiment. I hope that there was some value with it and that you guys enjoyed yourselves and were good to each other in the chat. We like to cultivate a good community here. Don't be jerks to each other. That's my one rule. Um, and as always, everyone, help elevate the discourse.